Welcome, everybody. So this is a bit of an out-of-the-box conversation, but uh, we feel like it's going to be a valuable thing to, to talk about. Um, I guess for me, this started a few years back at this conference uh, where there was a conversation with, uh, for those of you who weren't here, a man named Fred Provenza wrote this book. It's out on the table called Nourishment. And what it leads into is the ability of animals, wild animals and uh, domesticated animals and ourselves in our natural state to varying degrees, uh, ability to interact with uh, real diverse landscapes and diversity in general. And to be able to access information beyond what we have learned from birth. Um, so the example would be for for locating nourishment and locating self-medicating phytochemistry in the landscape. It dawned on me in some of the conversations we were having here about some very high-tech equipment to basically measure the same things and why does our species need an external nervous system in a sense to do what all the other animals and uh, uh, indigenous peoples and all of us to varying degrees. Uh, so we need to talk into here, okay. So that's that's one piece uh, of this that I'll uh, lead in with. Um, and another one is a, uh, an, an interesting book that I read. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with it. It's called Return to the Brain of Eden. It's uh, very fascinating territory. I'll try to summarize very quickly in that um, it's proposing that our original state uh, it, that came from tropical forest ecosystems and our diets that were loaded in flavonoids and neurotransmitter precursors and hormone modulators uh, were the period when our brains tripled in size as a primate. And, um, and then when we left that environment into savannas because of climate change and, and moving into grassland environments and eating more grasses and more meat, that there were some uh, imbalances that were occurring that, long story short, moved us toward a more of a left brain dominance um, kind of a situation that we find ourselves deeply within now to the point where we don't remember well uh, outside of that. However, uh, all cultures have these stories that have a lot of overlap about a golden age or a falling from grace or a period when we were in really close connection with animals. Um, and then um, different things happen. So I think that, that this story is, is largely talking about the uh, breach between the left and the right brain uh, and the ability of the left brain to control and suppress the, the aspects of the right brain that have high levels of capacity for recognizing uh, patterns beyond what the left brain can keep track of complexity-wise. Uh, I will say that the, the, one of the strongest pieces in here that have influenced me was that uh, in, the, in the modern era, there have been a whole series of cases of people with bullet wounds and strokes and baseball bats and car accidents that had their left frontal lobe removed or knocked out temporarily or permanently. And in that group of people, there have been an emergence of uh, pretty phenomenal um, autistic savant capacities in music, art, language, and math. And so how do you explain that those abilities are rising spontaneously? The absence of the control system uh, in place is what it looks to me. So there's another thing that's I think that goes back quite a long time, and it seems that like there's a pattern of uh, different cultural responses to this, that wise people saw this happening in, in each of the different uh, cultures. And in the Eastern traditions, there was a, been a, a strong tendency toward meditation and, um, and yoga and things like that. In the Western traditions, there was some on both sides of the other, but uh, in general, there was a lot of uh, shamanic use of entheogenic plants. Sure Still, you to speak a little, okay, a little sorry. Uh, so the enthe entheogens or psychoactive plants have this ability to remove that, um, that firewall pretty rapidly, maybe in a, in a kind of a chaotic way and needs to a lot of you know, guidance and control. 
Um, you know, for example, Michael Pollan's talking about this now. It's become popular after you know a lot of us have known this for a very long time. But uh, he's he's talking about how as little as one dose of psilocybin can allow a person to break addictions. And I think a lot of the patterns we're trying to move away from with you know monocultures and chemicals and control and hierarchy and male dominance and so forth. These are all things you can expect when you have an unbalanced left brain. And so what we're not talking about getting rid of or demonizing the left brain, we want to balance it. And so moving into this uh, more uh, democratic relationship between our lobes of our brain. And uh, so there's those pieces. Uh, on that same point, um, uh, Dennis McKenna, uh, some of you may know uh, he's uh, done some interesting work with shamans in the Amazon. Um, one example I found fascinating was the going out with the shaman into the uh, rainforest and collecting um, species used for ayahuasca, which is a psychoactive plant um, blend, and uh, he would go out and listen to them, name it, put a number on it, and, and hear that this one is, you know, moderate, this one is strong, this one is weak, and then he numbered them all, took them back to the mass spectrometer and tested them for the compounds of dimethyltryptamines and uh, harmalines, and found that it was 100% right on the money, that this, this shaman had uh, nailed it. And he's like, wow, this is strange, because all of these are, uh, you know, science today only recognizes, you know, Banisteriopsis caopi, um, as, as the uh, species, and then here are these shamans that have a, a system of taxonomy that goes way beyond that. And when they asked the shamans, you know, how do you know the difference? What they told them was that they take, they ingest these compounds and then the, the different plants sing to them in different tones. And so <laughs> this points to a whole different kind of, of access to information than uh, I think generally science looks at. Um, but I think a lot of this has to do with our comfort with diversity and uh, the tendency to reduce diversity uh, more recently, particularly. Uh, why do people feel more comfortable with a mowed lawn or a, uh, a monoculture of row crops that they can control? And what is this need for control? And why do we um, have to reduce diversity? Because this has become a, an existential issue now. Uh, diversity is, is far too important to suppress. Um, and I've seen in, um, in, in quite a few, um, I've been doing some experiential learning curriculums with taking people out into tropical forests and into the natural world and experientially opening this process up. And uh, there's a nutritional component which ties into this uh, conference directly. Uh, and with higher levels of nutrition, it begins to empower uh, right brain and, and um, allow this, this process to kind of open up a bit. So there's another piece about just connection in general, which is um, this continuum between the gut-brain axis through the vagus nerve and the communication, say, from the, uh, certainly from the gut, but also the heart, because I think a lot of what we're talking about in this whole process is, is uh, very much about our heart and connection and so forth. So there's been a lot of emerging evidence of uh, the connectivity between the, the microbiome uh, and our brain uh, and our emotional states, anxieties, and other mental uh, imbalances emanating from the gut. And there was one recent study I looked at where they had been looking at uh, autistic mice and introducing one gut, gut microbe was able to totally change the social interaction of these mice. Uh, again, pointing to some power in the, uh, in, in the diversity in our gut. Um, so the, that continues out because the diversity in our gut is coming through, ideally through our food, uh, to local soils. When we walk in the forest, we're breathing in DNA that's being incorporated into our uh, microbiome and so on. Um, so, what I'd, I'd like to just open this conversation, let uh, my friends respond a little bit in, in their understanding of this, uh, but ideally come up with a, a, some tools that we can use 
to begin to counterbalance some of these forces because we're all being acted on very strongly by a number of forces, both uh, conditioning by the culture and the economy and social systems, uh, but also by uh, toxins in the environment. Endocrine disruption has been proven to, to disrupt the ability to ad adapt uh, in a healthy organism, animals and people, to adapt to a change in the environment to create huge amounts of stress where a healthy animal would just quickly adapt. For example, uh, glyphosate pathway through the vagus nerve um, and through communica intercellular communication is also having uh, issues uh, or, or showing serious blockage to our healthy, connected, communicating state. So a lot of this also has a lot to do with our sense of self. Uh, it's critical that we understand that we are uh, interdependent and connected to a, a super organism of sorts and we operate from that place as opposed to an isolated, um, it's not just our cells that are being isolated, it's our, our whole perception of who we are. And when we begin to act as a super organism in our representation of our behavior and our language of, of speaking for the other species that aren't being uh, represented, we enter into a whole other relationship, and that I think that's where we really need to go. Uh, I will open it up to some comments, whoever would like to step in. Uh, I'm Mark Cohen, by the way, and I'll let everybody introduce themselves. Um, hi, you all. My name is Guido Maze. I'm an herbalist who lives in Vermont. And as an herbalist, I think there's two main pieces to my work. Um, one is I engage in herbal therapy in a clinical setting. But the other is that herbalism is my personal practice, too. And what I mean by that is that I go out to the woods, and I talk to trees, and I go out to my garden, and I have these spiritual experiences with the plants in my garden. And I noticed, I think, early on, I've been, I've been gardening medicinal plants since 96, when I moved to Vermont. I noticed early on that my garden did a whole lot better if I just kind of, I described it as let, let the plants in the garden dictate where and how I was going to work to support that garden ecology, as opposed to me dictating where the plants were going to be and how they were going to grow. I started to notice, for example, that St. John's wort didn't like being planted where I put it, but would show up in another place and thrive and look great. And so pretty quickly after a couple growing seasons of seeing this with these perennial herbs, I just said, hey, I'm here to just support you with nutrition and water as necessary, hopefully not too much. It works out great because I'm a lazy gardener. But in the end, the thing that really was brought home to me is that I am more of a garden steward and an organ in this garden ecology or in this forest ecology where I'm having these connected experiences with plants. And so it got me to thinking about how perhaps when I'm working in the garden, my consciousness is not fully directed by me. It's partly directed by the garden. And that just felt incredible to me because it made me feel like my life was being directed by forces that were bigger than my own and with whom I could have a relational understanding as opposed to this top-down divinity to lowly human understanding that I'd been brought up with in the Catholic Church in Italy. So that's one part. It's this sort of idea of transpersonal, greater consciousnesses in which I'm embedded when I work in the garden or when I wild harvest in the forest. And y'all know if you're walking in a place and you, you, the air changes and the plants change and you're like, something is different here. Um, maybe I should pay attention. It's like you're walking into a different being. And there you find different plants and sometimes these strange thoughts come into my head that's like, you've got to take this kind of deer trail that you see on the right that you've never gone down, and who knows what you might find there. And lo and behold, on a south-facing rock with this big pile of deep forest humus, you find ginseng. Mm -hmm. And I don't harvest it, I sit there and I just say, ginseng, tell me your stories. I do grow some ginseng, but I refuse to wild harvest it because of its amazing presence in the woods, and I really feel like it, anyway, I won't get into it too much. The second side is that I'm a therapeutic person, which means I work with people one-on-one -on -one in clinic, and we're talking about mental health imbalances, for example. I have this protocol when working with people who come to me and are talking about anxiety, depression, and mood disruption that involves really a few different <coughs> stages. The first stage is gut microbiome, believe it or not, and using herbs that help sort of flush out potential dysbiotic species and set the stage for the reintroduction of healthy 
um, gut flora through ferment and prebiotic starches, for example, which come from medicinal plants like burdock and from fermented foods. All of that lays this amazing foundation for mental health, and we understand the mechanisms now, everything from leaky gut to disruption of the gut serotonergic system, for instance. Then you use herbs that catalyze balance in terms of neurotransmitter activity. We've got a lot of herbs that really mimic and echo the same neurotransmitters that we produce as human animals. The ecology produces them through plants as well, things like dopamine from Mucuna prurians, or St. John's wort, which modulates some of the serotonergic axes, or some of our adaptogen herbs like rhodiola that modulate like norepinephrine axes and the stress hormones, for instance. And then sometimes we'll use capstone experiences using agents like psilocybin, which I use in my practice. Don't tell anyone about that. <laughs> and, or salvinorin A from this incredible shamanic plant, that's all right, called salvia divinorum, which has been used to communicate with the spirits of nature since forever. And so this brought into my thinking the idea that our consciousness and our thoughts and our spirits are also connected to what's going on down here and what's going on in our internal environment, as much as they're connected to what's going on in our external environment and how we commune with that. And that leads me to believe that, honestly, what we think of as our personal consciousness really doesn't have discrete or well-defined edges, which is both really scary because what the heck am, am I if I don't have an edge, but also really empowering because I'm simply a nexus in the movement of consciousness, energy, and chemistry that's flowing throughout the natural world. And, and when that realization comes to your mind, I don't know. It feels really liberating to me. So that's the perspective I bring. Um, herbal medicine can be used for therapy, and it relies on understanding the human being as a superorganism with a lot of other organisms living inside it, but also as a part of a greater super, super organism, as Mark was alluding to. And when those shifts start to happen, I've noticed in my clients and in myself, it gets a lot harder to talk about deforestation with a glib attitude. It gets a lot harder to talk about industrial pollution with a glib attitude. And you begin to reframe your thinking around regenerative ideas, which are the same ideas that we see in herbal medicine therapy. When regenerative growers and farmers are talking about techniques for soil management and crop management, those are the exact same ideas that I talk about when I'm talking about regenerative therapeutics in the context of human health and disease. So, you know, it's so encouraging for me to see that on the macro level, in farms and gardens, folks are talking about the same things we're talking about on the human level um, when we talk about herbal therapeutics. So that's a little bit about sort of the perspective I bring to this and, and why I resonate with what Mark is talking about and, and what I heard Reginaldo talk about um, yesterday when he was detailing his incredible poultry system. Hello, I'm Reinaldo, and I speak for the chickens. <laughs> uh, this is fun. Uh, listen, the, um, I'm not going to do too much of that science and all of the, um, the stuff that we normally geek about. I'm going to actually... Uh, so here's the thing. I, was, um, I went to a culture school in Guatemala and then studied business management and communications at Augsburg University in Minnesota. And in between all of that, I completed like three masters, which I never went for the graduation thing for. And all of that was in search of a more holistic understanding, not only of who I am as a, as a bunch of energy floating around, but also as, a, as an individual that can have a positive or a negative impact around everywhere I go. All of us will do that no matter what. So having been raised uh, mostly by, with, with folks with a very deep indigenous understanding of the world was really critical in finding that pathway. Now, here's what I mean. We, we tend to think of indigenous and natives as one in the same. Uh, there is no such, no such thing. Not in my world anyway, and I'll let you decide for yourself. But the way I see it is, and the way I was brought up is, you know, technically we are all, every single person on earth is indigenous. It's indigenous to the earth, period. Unless you didn't come from this earth, then I will, ex you know, excuse you from that classification. <laughs> now, some of us are native to certain parts of the world, 
like North America, like Latin America, like South America, and so on. But that's a different thing. And that's where the, the whole you know, thing about whether you live in the rainforest like I did or in the desert, and that defines a lot of how we see the world. And because of our origins and our geoevolutionary process, we are all connected at very deep levels no matter what. And that connectedness doesn't materialize until we start understanding these very things that we're talking about. And one thing we have to understand right up front, you know, Guido, you, you related to that. The way I was explaining it when I was a kid was, they, and this is based, based literally later, you know, 15, 20 years later, I learned about it, you know, from the laws of thermodynamics that Einstein exposed us to. The laws of, um, you know, the first law that deals with the conservation of energy. You can't produce it, you can't destroy it, you can only transform it. And the second one is the law of entropy, where everything tends to dissipate. This, in this coffee, if I leave it here long enough, this would empty out because it tends to dissipate. Now, we are a very highly organized um, system of energy. But that energy that you carry around, that energy has been through dinosaurs, trees, bugs, butterflies, birds. It has been in the ocean, in the air, everywhere for millions of years. You just happen to be borrowing it right now so you can be here. And just the same as you started borrowing when you were born, you will have to give it away when you go away. And it will become something else. Now, understanding that is what makes us indigenous, not being native to a specific space. Now, to the extent that we don't understand that, it's very difficult to be part of a world where we can see each other as just part of a universal expression of an evolutionary process which nature has designed and perfected so that we can be right here, right now. To me, with that foundation, it's very easy to do regenerative engineering. It's very easy to understand the relationship within the gut, the heart, the brain, all of that. It's just a big canvas. It's a piece of art. And then we come here with this science and technology, which I was very well trained on, and row crops and inputs and a piece of land and then outputs on the other side, and we, and we allow that to take over. Now, why did, why did we go in that direction? Mark and I were just discussing this point before we came in here, and, and it hit me that all the way from Angus King and before him, communities, in order to control the, 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 the bandits, so to speak, the ones with the control, the control freaks in their communities, they exiled them because there were no jails or any of that. And what do you do if out of this group, you know, we take the, the five troublemakers and then we put them away and send them out into the forest? Well, they band together. And then the other village does the same. They band together and then you end up creating this very, you know, sophisticated and very powerful little group, which, by the way, all you need is a small group like that to take over a whole society. And hence, we started colonizing the rest and the rest and the rest until Christopher Columbus ended up around here. Now, there's a big difference between that mentality, that left, left frontal lobe mentality of control and order and all of that so that you can actually manipulate everything, which is what we use when we, start, when we call ourselves farmers. We don't see ourselves as energy managers, as energy managers of non you know, edible energy, which we then manage through a process or at least oversee or, you know, like Guido say, observe and try to become part of so that on the other end, we can have edible energy in the form of carrots and eggs and chickens and all of that. We, I don't believe farmers think of themselves like that. I think that most of us think of ourselves as chicken producers or carrot producers or herb producers, but we are not. None of us produces a thing. It all produces itself. And if we can just focus on, on, on stewarding that energy from, from this entropic form to a highly organized form, and we, we, we commune with that, with that historical and that amazing system, we actually do much better than otherwise. And that requires that we intellectually understand 
why diversity is important, back to restoring those neurological pathways. But why is it, well, I mean, to the point of what's different between the colonizers that came to the United States versus the native people who were here already. It's not like the native people were not colonizing each other either. They were already doing that. The Mayans were doing that. The natives here were doing that too. Christopher Columbus wasn't the colonizer. He was just one that was out of balance in that in a relationship between the holistic brain and the order-based part of the brain. So what did we have in the native communities that these other folks didn't have? We had a detox system. And what Guido was talking about, and what Mark was talking about, was that we actually had this process by which as we became more you know, engaged in, in dominating each other, we also had a continuous going back to reconnect with that world that I was talking about at the beginning. And so we were able to balance this thing and just stay in control of the two of them. These folks who came, they no longer had control. They were literally mentally ill. And that mental illness is what landed us where we are today. And to be able to cure ourselves from that, we have to detox. And there is no better detox than everything that nature created. Remember, we walk around with a magnetic field around us. That's what we produce. In fact, if I, if in these days, you can shock somebody because we produce electromagnetic uh, you know, fields and, 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 and static electricity and all of that, uh, energy and all of that. And that creates a little protective system around us. If you get too close to somebody with a strong personality, you can feel it. Now, you have to get in touch with, with that ability that we have, which is called innate intelligence, to be able to know those things. We happen to be raised in a space where we were taught how to know that. We always knew where north was. We always knew uh, when it was going to rain. Maybe not as far as what you can do with satellite now, because you can see the clouds. But, but we knew the, the way your body reacts to the changes in barometric pressure is very specific. But you won't know that unless you're paying attention, and so on. That connectedness was a way to detox. The trees, they don't produce electromagnetic fields. They produ produce chemical fields. <coughs> a forest can be floating and at any given time between 400 and 600 chemicals. We evolved over you know, absorbing those, those chemicals and interacting with them and letting them cure us. And that was part of the mental stability. That's part of connecting back to that energy cycles in life. When we do those things, everything's Everything makes sense, and we start to see each other very differently when we actually understand who we are in this very long process of energy transformation. So let's be thankful for the fact that we have this energy today, that we can actually have a conversation about it, and let's go back and start thinking about how we, we re-indigenize ourselves so we can actually become part of the system instead of believing somehow in this illusion that we can control it. It is simply not possible. Okay, so um, I guess I'd like to return momentarily back to kind of the experiential aspect of this. And um, something happened for me when, uh, as a dowser, I began getting into dowsing for originally for water and then for other energetic fields in the landscape, much like healers look at the nervous uh, system pathways and pressure points and such in the body. Um, but I won't go into that too much. I, what I wanted to say about it was that when, in my opinion, all intelligent organisms come to terms with a, 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 inevitably with the fact that they are simultaneously finite and infinite. And when the part of our being that's finite has needs, particularly when they're really strong needs, when you're in trouble, when you're uh, existentially challenged, uh, there's a communication that's forced. But in, in the dowsing process, uh, it's not, when I say dowsing, I mean all cultures through time that had systems of divination, of accessing information fields that were far beyond what they had learned from birth you know, tapping into racial memory and uh, other uh, informational fields. And when that, 
question gets put from the finite to the infinite, and you get a strong either muscular response or um, clear communication back, uh, there's an there's a inevitable dissolution of a previous perception of uh, finiteness but separation. I guess I would say, and, and from that separated space, I, I think is emerging the fears that are driving the, uh, and, and the fears are being derived from being culturally taught and being chemically uh, affected and all sorts of other types of abuse that turns eventually back into an abusing uh, response. You know, ab abusers, ab abused people turn into abusers very often. And so in order to break that cycle, there's this fusion experience, and uh, Guido was uh, allu alluding to it, I think, uh, for those of us who have had these intuitive experiences in the forest when we're either looking for mushrooms or ginseng or something, and we get uh, taken down these you know, side pathways and processes open up, um, uh, that is really resonating with, a, with the longest period of human existence. And uh, as hunter-gatherers, it was easily 90 plus percent of our history, and yet we're really being dominated by thought uh, in this last 10,000 years as agricultural uh, species and, and so forth. And so we're, we're waking up abilities that are really critical. We have this massive neurological system uh, that's incredibly complex, that uh, we have receptors and neurons that are, and communication molecules that are, that are uh, sending messages, the, the question is, are we reading from the whole dashboard or are we, you know, cutting, cutting lines because we don't like the news and so we, we, we cut the, the dashboard lights uh, uh, out to what we want to deal with. And so how do we wake that back up is, is part of the question, but I also had been looking at um, in this process of developing a sense of place and looking at compatibility with biodiversity. Uh, and comfort levels and fears and where do the fears really arise from. Um, I, a lot of it came down to how we define ourselves. Are we, um, how finite and, and uh, separate are we? So I began looking at like a Buddhist concept of small mind and big mind and uh, the process of moving from that, from small mind to big mind and kind of going from egocentric to anthropocentric to biocentric. And so in an egocentric state, we would be really looking for our own benefit. And then we start moving into thinking that uh, maybe we care about all people and that we should save rainforests because there's medicine there for us, uh, as opposed to inherent um, sacramental nature of, of this larger superorganism. And I, I started to c connect uh, tendencies at these different levels. And, so from the egocentric, there's a feeling of separation. Uh, at the biocentric, there's an interdependent uh, relationship to wholeness and, and diversity. And, um, and then a logical outcome of separation is fear and then hoarding and greed. And greed. Um, at the biocentric end, and, uh, it's, it's really more of a sense of wonder and respect and gratitude and generosity. Um, you find yourself moving from linear to cyclical thinking, short-term to long-term thinking, the idea of what, when you're considering uh, an effect on the world seven generations out compared to the fiscal year profits. Um, these are fundamental thought processes that are, that are molding our decisions. Uh, mechanistic and reductionistic to organic, alive, holistic relationships. Um, in, in religion, it tends to be uh, external gods uh, uh, that are tending to be male at the separated end and divinity within now um, at the uh, more integrated biocentric end. And, um, you know, heaven is something that happens after death, uh, you know, on, the, on that piece. The centralized to decentralized, competitive to cooperative emphasis. You get my point, but the, the you know the, this first category seems to define perfectly uh, the, the generally the the world's uh, governments at this time, with a few exceptions in Bhutan and places like that. Um, so, should we open it up? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I guess we'll open it up to questions and we'll deal with the rest of it from there, but we just wanted to get this out out in the air. It's it's not a, a typical. Um, 
category, but maybe down the line the conference can integrate a, a category to speak to some of this territory because it seems to be really underlying. Uh, yes? Yeah, I've been waiting for a panel like this for three years um, because um, one of the things I think, and perhaps it's also coming from an herbalist perspective, um, I'm not a public herbalist, I'm private, you know, I do that with family and I come from the tradition of herbalism in, in uh, the Balkans. And so for me, um, I really appreciated this, um, a few things. One is that relationship to being indigenous to the earth and native to a space and finding an inroad for all of us to relate to that. Um, but then also um, when it comes to the farming and when people are talking about farming, I really um, am only now starting to see a space where people are talking about leaving room for the native intelligence of the native plants to come through. Because without that, we will lose those medicines and we'll lose all of that relationship. So I just really want to comment and thank you that I've been waiting for someone to say that. Sure. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, detoxing. What is that? Like, what do you do to detox? Mm. And can I remind them, like, if you repeat yeah. the question yeah. so it gets into the recording? Sure. Yeah, the, the first was a comment, so I won't repeat that. But the, um, the question about what did, I believe, Reginaldo refer to as uh, detoxing? Yeah, maybe Guido and I, if you don't mind, could answer that together. Because I think we just got a lot more of the experience on the specific herbs, for example, that can be used to, to flush out, to, to move toxins out of your body. Now, that is one, one kind of detoxification. What I was talking about is um, decolonization of the mind. So detoxifying and getting rid of the virus of greed and colonized thinking. To do that, we go back to understanding who we are. Literally, we are just, again, a lot of energy, highly organized, so that we can do what we're doing right now, which will eventually disorganize again and reorganize in another form. So to detoxify what native communities in, the, in this hemisphere, which is what I know more, but it's also the same around the world, uh, those folks who were continuing to practice indigenous understanding of the earth and their role within it would go back to either meditation in our case, the forest walks are about the best detox you could ever do for mental, but also physical. They, uh, well, actually both, they are the same anyway. Um, so these chemicals in the forest, uh, having grown up in the war, was, there was nothing more like mind-blowing and amazing. What it would do to take your shoes off and barefoot stand in a piece of ground that has not been treated by anybody. And the immediate, it, it is almost like if you are afraid right now of something, and all you do is you take a deep breath through your nose, and exhale through your mouth, and instantly the brain and the body gets a message, it's okay. And all of your all of, your, all of those chemicals that we produce to defend and to fight and all of that go away. Uh, not all of them, but it goes away to a certain extent. And then if you continue, you meditate a little bit, all of that gets the brain back to a level where you can actually think again with the more creative part. You are not in the flight, fight kind of mode. And in the forest, what we, what we did was really allow the energy in the space to balance out our, our imbalance that came from being under attack very frequently. And so that was one way we kept detoxifying. But remember, detox isn't something that you do and it's done. That's something we have to do continuously. We go out there and all of these chemicals, you're going to absorb them through the palm of your hands, your feet, through your breathing, all of that. They're going to come back in you. And if we don't have those exceptional biopathways that some people have that can actually eliminate things, which I'm so envious of. Um, <laughs> if we don't have, we're not blessed with that kind of biopathway, the rest of us has to continuously go back and detoxify. And to us, the w best way, because we were being trained and there were agronomists coming in with chemicals when I was still a kid and all of that. 
And I remembered uh, one detoxification experience that we had in relationship to this, to this mentality that you can control the weeds and so on and so forth. Um, we, it was the first time we were using this chemical called gramoxone. I don't know how many of you have been exposed to it. It's an old chemical. Um, it was the first one that made it into our region. Our problem with weeds in the rainforest was primarily grasses. And this gramoxone could kill all of them. And so we applied it. I wrote this in my book. It's called uh, In the Shadow of Green Man. And I wrote, that's the spiritual grounding to the next publication I'm writing, which is all the techniques and all of that for the regenerative poultry system that I presented on yesterday. But that story was really powerful because we did what everybody was doing. We followed the instructions. We killed all the weeds. Uh, we in, and remember, working with those weeds is very hard physically and all of that. So obviously we wanted a, a better solution, right? The thing is, when we finished that, we came back with some of the elders and with my dad in charge, and we observed this space, and we had a meditation about it. And what my dad said to the rest of the group was that he couldn't do this. He couldn't repeat this. And the reason was, is something can be so violent that even the worst weeds couldn't survive it. What would it do to us? It was like I didn't never had to think of whether I was going to or not going to use chemicals. I was maybe nine years old, and I made my decision then. That is detoxification of the mind, decolonization of the mind, and we have to do that every single day these days because we are surrounded by it. Everything from the way these chairs were laid out to the way we even approach this conversation is fully colonized. Um, my job. Maybe I'll... Add just a little bit on the question of what is this concept of detox, and I'll start by saying I push back still on the idea of detox because there's this weird implication that we're dirty, <laughs> which I don't believe. And again, as a recovering Catholic, this idea that we're born <laughs> sinful is not one that I really resonate with, um, though there are other pieces that I do resonate with. So for me, like Rodrigo Naldo was saying, detox is complex and multi-layered and it can happen at many different levels. So to give you some examples, I need to go through a personal detox at least a couple times a year that involves going out to the ridgelines of the Green Mountains and sitting out there for three or four days with a tent and some water and that's it. And that's pretty incredible. It gives me creative fodder to last six months when I do that. And it's because the day-to-day -day stuff that I have to deal with, which is the reality of our modern life, goes away after about 24 to 36 hours of being out in the forest, your brain rhythms start to shift, partly because we're living in this environment that's eluding all of this chemistry, the woods, that evolutionarily has meaning for us. And so plugging back into that um, is sort of a, a major first detox step for me that I need to go through personally. The idea of sort of having a, a daily detox as well, where you put down all the devices, and maybe you turn off some lights, and maybe you just spend a little time out in the garden sitting and having a meditative practice or something like that um, also can be really effective. But for many people, that's really tough to do. Um, part of the reason is because we are so bombarded with everything from the information superhighway to our devices, and they're pinging us every single day, and the TVs and the radio and the cars going at 100 miles an hour, etc. So what I found as an herbalist is that sometimes you can intervene with plants that have biochemical detoxification effects, and we define that very specifically in herbal medicine as things that improve liver function, our main detoxification and metabolic organ, generally improve the secretion of bile, um, help people poop better and perspire better so that the system flows, right? So that any material that needs to be eliminated can be eliminated. And what I found is that when we use herbs that affect biochemical detoxification pathways, it has this impact on the mind, too, and on our ability to do things like back off and engage in observation and stop like running blindly forward in the service of profit and progress, which is a difficult thing to say. It's like, I'm just going to take a moment, um, and I'm going to have a full night's sleep because I might actually perform better tomorrow if I do that as opposed to spending four hours trying to finish this project tonight. Mm -hmm. So 
to bring it back um, and talk about how detoxification works at multiple different levels um, and go back to this idea of you know, violent chemistry that Reynaldo was talking about, which we somehow feel comfortable using. No one is stopping like Reynaldo's father and saying like, wait a second, how is this stuff affecting the ecology in which we live and therefore us in the end? No one is stopping to think about that because we're so driven by these ideas. You might call them left brain if you want to, um, you know, or you could just call them sort of modern techno corporate capitalism, which has been the dominant paradigm for a little while. Um, and so I'll just tell a story that I tell all the time. So apologies to those who've heard this before. I had a client who was coming to talk to me about the effects of eating the food that the techno capitalist corporate market gives us and how it generated symptoms for him, like heartburn or constipation or difficulty with digestion. And he didn't have a lot of experience with herbal medicine. Um, the last thing I wanted to do was, as a tangent, when the corporate, capitalist, profit-driven herbal world, which exists, we call it the dietary supplement industry, gets a hold of herbal medicine and this idea of detox, what does it do? It makes the twice a year colon cleanse product to clean your dirty colon so that you can be detoxed and less inflamed. It's like, <laughs> it's so crazy to see how these indigenous concepts of relating to the world get co-opted by the machine in this totally non-mindful way. But anyway, that's a tangent. The point is that I said, rather than doing those sorts of things, let me introduce you to this dandelion root extract and take that a couple times a day before your meals and see what it does for your symptoms. And we know about dandelion that it improves um, sort of hepatobiliary action, improves bile secretion, helps regulate bowel function. It's one of our classic simple bitters and has been used in detox support by herbalists forever. So he tries this for a little while. Um, a couple weeks later, he comes back um, for our follow-up and he says, you know, I really like the dandelion root tincture. It, it's helped me. I'm having a lot less heartburn and my digestion generally feels a lot better. And you might say he detoxed his digestion a little bit. But the thing that I think is much more profound is that he said to me, is that the same dandelion that's in my yard? And, and can I use this too? I'm like, absolutely you can. He's like, is it the same stuff that I spray Roundup on? <laughs> and, and I said, yes, don't use those. Stop spraying the Roundup. And he's like, I think I will. <laughs> so that implies to me that you can use biochemical detoxification that might rebalance digestive function, help us eliminate some material that the liver might not be processing really well. And lo and behold, this has these weird effects on the brain because psyche and soma are not connected. And not only that, but then the different choices that that human makes who is connected relationally to an indigenous plant, a plant, plants are indigenous, and they relate to the world that way, then all of a sudden can have these ecological impacts. And imagine if everyone who lives in a suburban lawn with sprays rammed up on their dandelions had that same experience that that guy had. We would have cultural detox. Mm -hmm. So it happens at like multiple different levels, um, though there are some very specific biochemical pathways that can be employed to catalyze that. And that's what a lot of these quote-unquote detox herbs do if they're applied properly and gently and with respect as opposed to commodified and used twice a year. I often tell my clients, you know, if you wanted to lose weight, would you run, uh, would you just sit on the couch all year long except for once a year you'd run 20 miles a day every single day and not eat? No, no one would try to lose weight that way. But that's how we think of detox in the modern dietary supplement world. It's not, like Reginaldo said, an experience that you have and then you're enlightened. It's a daily habit that retrains your mind to not look at the world in this reductionist way, um, which science has sometimes forced us to do because it's trying to control variables and get an understanding of what's happening in the world. And I respect that and I get it. But the world can't be controlled. It just can't. It has to be lived. And getting people back into that place is really what I think detox is about. I had the privilege of attending Ronaldo's course of session yesterday, where, where he talked about his, his poultry and his method of farming. And I would suggest going online and getting the recording of that and listening to it. it, it to me, it was um, 
it was a wonderful manifestation of, of putting this type of, of um, at one with the universe practice into farming. It was an amazing um, example. Um, I would like to hear a little bit about how that relates, how you can, how, how that works with more of a produce focus, more of a vegetative focus. I, I really got the mix of the chickens and the plants and how they, how you, how, how it became clear which plants do better in certain areas with the focus on the poultry farming. Um, what I wanted to know is if there were just sort of any ways to get a better sense of how to do that if you're dealing simply with vegetative growth. It, it was just an amazing example of how um. Since, since this is not the poultry session, <laughs> and, and in respect of that topic, I will write a note and I can communicate with you on that. But it is part of this detox we're talking about. It's part of that daily meditation. We didn't arrive at that system just because I am an engineer. Um, that part was actually useful, just like Giro just said. We, have, we still need to balance, and Mark also mentioned about that balance. All I did was balance, you know, Western, you know, straight line thinking mm -hmm. with the four-dimensional nature of farming. And as a result, we can engineer absolutely awesome systems. We don't have to compromise on, you know, the comforts of top quality chicken and eggs. Uh, we just got to get to it through the right pathway. That's all I'm going to say, because we are still talking about brain waves here. Yeah, that's so that's let right. it... The brain waves really <laughs> okay. Before the next question, let me just throw one thing out on brain waves, and that the toxins aren't always coming from uh, the uh, outside. Um, and actually, Reginaldo was speaking to that, this co colonialism in our, in our own head. But there's another level to this of um, the emotional states that we hold in our body is changing the chemistry in real time in our blood. There's a, a, a woman named Candace Pert wrote a book on, uh, called Molecules of Emotion. And Bruce Lipton wrote a, a, a book called uh, Biology of Belief, uh, if you want to dive into this territory a little bit. But a, a lot of this is, uh, you know, toxins that we produce, you know, in the moment, depending on how we hold um, the awareness in, in, our, in our mind. So uh, this, you're talking about meditation, there's a wide range of, of states that we can talk about in that, but we are actually producing, in a sense, at the end of the day, we're either producing, you know, stress molecules and cortisols and things like that from anger and hatred and, and those kinds of emotions or, um, you know, in, in a state of love, we'd be producing a whole different set of compounds. And uh, uh, so anyway, I just thought I'd throw the, that in there as part of a, a larger conversation about detox in, in how we think. Uh, that, that whole thing's really well documented, Mark, in, in terms of experiencing love and having biochemical shifts happen in the body, and also the rhythms of our brain waves, our respiratory, mm -hmm. tidal rhythm, and our heart rhythm all entrain and sync up. And then because the heart is an electromagnetic oscillator, and if we're in that state and we relate to someone else, boy, those two people begin to sync up. And you can do that with plants because plants resonate electromagnetically via the photosystem. I don't know about chickens, but I bet that they do as well. They are 98 degrees right. Fahrenheit temperature, and if you got that temperature, you will produce a magnetic field. So they will move. So yes, I don't know who is first, but. Behind now, but. Oh, you pick. move to the front, yes. So this, I want to thank all of you for this conversation. It's so needed. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's the compliment to all of the techie stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's the biodynamic way. It's the Rudolf Steiner way. You know, and it's the indigenous way. And I love this narrative around decolonizing our lives, <laughs> re-indigenizing. <clears throat> and what you're talking about is, is forest bathing. It's using psychoactive drugs, not just for, you know, not drugs, but, but the plants, not, ju <coughs> not just to dissolve the edges, but to navigate the edges, because that's the most fertile place. When we 
we have one foot firmly in our groundedness and we extend our boundaries and feel the connection, the communication. And I wanted to ask you, Ronaldo, you, you were saying something about, I'm, an, I'm trained in energy medicine. And when you say we're electromagnetic, I got that. But then you said something about trees emitting chemicals. And I was like, wait a minute. And you might have something to say about this too. It's like, what's he talking about? Because my understanding is, um, you know, there's more of a, a synchronicity of energetic components between plants and trees and ourselves. And maybe I shouldn't, maybe plants and trees are their own. <clears throat> in any case, uh, trees are some big entities. You know? um, I wanted you to speak on that, and um, I just, yeah, I mean, I've just been. Next time, maybe we can have a circle. Next time, maybe we can go outside. <laughs> Next time, maybe we can just rest to go outside and be in a circle, and you bring some kind of ceremonial center anchor and and we complement what's going on out there with that because that's the experiment the experiential piece that's missing i just said to the western price leader we need more herbalists we need to cross pollinate herbal conferences with these type of conferences get more women in here get more indigenous people in here and start talking about communicating and merging with the intelligence. Because if we just keep, if it's just a matter of inputs, then we're just like the functional doctors who are using the nutraceuticals from the compound pharmacy and have these laboratory calls to fix something. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, I want to hear about the panel. All right, so the ceremonial, I will love to do it. Um, <laughs> the only thing I'm going to have to prepare way ahead because I got to ship the components that you can't bring them on a plane, uh, <laughs> or I or I have to drive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but you are in Massachusetts, though. Yeah. Um, about tree as entities. Um, so let's just for a second remember that in this context, there is no individual entities on Earth. The Earth is one entity, made out of an amazing array of geoevolutionary arrangements of energy that create different patterns of organizing that energy. Some of it are carrots, some of it are worms, some of it is us. None of us are unique, you know, all of us, I mean, all of us are unique in a certain way of print and stuff, but at the end of the day, we are all exchanging energy in a continuous and in unstoppable ways. So the trees are doing the same thing with each other and with us. That's the disconnection that sometimes allows us, most of the time, that disconnection is what allows us to just cut a tree down with no feelings. I had to cut a black walnut recently, and I didn't, I mean, I hadn't experienced such a sense of sadness and, and feelings like what you were describing. Um, because we are also farmers, and so we sometimes have to shoot a possum because it's going to eat all your freaking chickens. So, you know, that kind of thing. And I always have this whole process by which I do that so I can be at peace with everything. Cutting this walnut was very hard, and I couldn't understand why. I mean, I have cut a lot of trees, but this walnut was different. I had an experience before because somebody came about 10 years ago when I was developing the poultry system, we call it tree ranch because we raised the poultry under uh, multiple canopies of trees just the way they evolved over evolutionary time. And there was this farmer who had a walnut grove and he asked me, um, oh, my dad says I should do, just cut all the walnuts because they dis decimate everything under them. And I went back and I thought, hmm. Well, in, uh, in my training, in my upbringing, we don't just do things like that. We try to understand the world from the perspective of either the chicken, the possum, the hawk, or in this case, the walnut tree. So I went back and studied a little bit more about these chemicals that plants emit. And I realized that, and I learned just by 
com by just inferences and by just logical things that we already have, by using and accessing the innate intelligence. Not books, not data, none of that. Our innate intelligence, the intelligence we're born with, is actually way more powerful than that. This is what Mark was talking about before, and it's so real. Um, so I went back to all that experience in the rainforest. Before I went to ag school, um, I learned a lot of this relationship with the trees and the land and the microbes. And it was very hard to go through that training. I still had to pass because the only way to school was through a scholarship. So I still had to graduate. But it was very painful because I couldn't agree with most of what we were being taught. So same thing, we're looking at this place and I'm trying to figure out what, why is the walnut not allowing things to grow under? And so I said, we're not going to touch them. We're going to do a two-year experiment. And we're going to see whether the walnut can relax mm -hmm. and whether the walnut can start, stop fighting. It's obviously fighting something. What is it fighting? We didn't know that. Now, can we look at the world from the perspective of the walnut? And we started doing that. And I said, well, what is the first thing that we all have to have every day to be able to keep going? Water, food, nutrients. What balances our brain waves and all of that? Good quality nutrition. There's nothing better than that. Mostly because the brain and everything is, is, is evolved because of the gut, because of what we have eaten over, over millions of years. And so I said, well, let's put the chickens under, leave them alone, and let's give the chicken a good quality nutrition. And in those chickens, we included a lot of herbs and nutraceuticals and all kinds of other things. I developed a, a specific diet for those chickens so that we could give those trees in a biologically uh, available way everything they needed. Okay, I could take you there right now. We haven't touched the trees yet and everything is thriving under them. Mm, wow. Everything. We are growing beautiful uh, forages under in, in Northfield, Minnesota. The, the elderberries and the, and the hazelnuts that we put in the understory, were, they were never developed there. Even the sumac didn't pass the edge. All, everything is growing now, and we haven't touched the trees. And that connection is what made me feel this thing about this last tree. Mm. That's what I'm going to tell you. This is a real story. I'm not making a single thing up. I can show you the pictures because I've been taking pictures because we were deliberate and conscious about learning from this space. That is what we need to detoxify, to be, become more indigenous. That's how you re-indigenize. And that is how we become the best farmers that the world are. I still don't understand the chemical part, though. Like you're saying, the trees are your chemicals, and you in the electromagnetic field. Well, the trees also use electromagnetism. The thing is that we actually create a magnetic field. Oh. The, 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 the trees actually create a chemical field. The temperature is actually, they don't produce heat. We produce heat. And heat is critical in order to produce electromagnetic fields. And so that's, that's, and so they, we create defenses. What I was saying is that we have a shield around ourselves because of that. And when we have many other biological shields that separate us and that keeps us from getting sick of every breath we take. So the trees create the same kind of protection. And, but, but they do it through chemicals and they communicate through that. They interlock roots sometimes to communicate with each other. And they use the mycosphere as the foundation, as their in, underground internet. This is well known. We knew this yeah. growing up. It's just that now it's being documented and now people are starting to express this like, like my, my Mark was saying before. Um, but, the, but the bottom line is that that is done so that they can, as organisms, thrive. You know, all of us need to grow, reproduce, protect, and eventually we die. I mean, and they are protecting themselves. So the walnut was simply scared of not having enough to perpetuate its own mm -hmm. species. And that is why it was producing all these chemicals to get rid of anything that could compete with it. Once we eliminated the scarcity mentality that the walnut was operating under, which is the same thing we do, that's why we fight with each other, compete with each other, trip, trample over each other, and all of that, push others down because we have this scarcity mentality. That was going on with the tree in a very different universe. The tree may not think like us, but it was reacting to the same incentive. Once we remove the threat, 
it relaxed and everything is growing. Mm. That's what I'm saying. So, um, so this is a very powerful point. So we'll hover here for just a moment. Uh, I've been thinking about this too. And um, so the plant and the soil have a bi-directional flow. And the, uh, Christine Jones was here a year or two ago and we were talking about the liquid carbon pathway. And when the plant is getting uh, its needs met, it is able to share uh, much more of the photosynthetic energy with the soil community, with the microbes and the fungi. And then in turn, it receives more back and it literally is priming this pump. What Reginaldo is getting into here is kind of the third level, which is, uh, you know, the, the, the walnut tree produces these secondary metabolites to control the environment uh, because there's a scarcity. Uh, but if there's no scarcity, then the, uh, it's unnecessary to produce those chemistry, that chemistry. Uh, but when you add that healthy plant, that, that healthy plant gets eaten by an animal or a person, um, and when that person gets its needs met, nutritionally, emotionally, um, socially, then it can be, leap into more of an open source type mode rather than patenting and you know, th this whole relationship to the economy of, of trying to control its values into that larger community um, is like the walnut tree um, that when it gets its needs met properly, then we can all jump into pulling out our deepest values and sharing it with this larger system and getting to this level of, of uh, large-scale abundance that we haven't seen yet, really, and, and I think is very possible. Just wanted to say that. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> I think you were, had your head up first. Uh, somebody's going to have to keep track here. Radical shifting. So I'm going to throw this out there as maybe a crazy idea. It's really, it's really important to make some shifts in right? Individually, globally. So if we use the idea of the microbiome is a popular topic right now on mass, right? It's very common for doctors, conventional doctors, to be talking about that now. So, if, and if we understand that the biome likely needs to be more complex for more complex thinking to occur, and after 15 years in three different restaurants, trying to shift people's food is more challenging than shifting a beverage choice, and beverages really spin through our spin through our culture very quickly. And if we think of veins and rivers and the internet, what I'm proposing, there's a new book out right now called Antisocial. And it, it drilled down into social media to talk about mm -hmm. how literally a thousand people from one lawyer in South, in South, uh, um, yeah, Southern California got information from the Drudge Report to Fox News to CNN, a thousand people. So here's my proposition. If we have some really great verbal times that could impact the gut, that we popularize through the veins of the internet, <laughs> and, had, and, and use that tool as an opportunity, as a pathway into people, that maybe could shift the consciousness faster than if we did it one by one. Because that, that was amazing to me to learn that a thousand people that this lawyer in Southern California activated through Twitter that ended up with messages on major networks. I mean, what if we thought about that? Veins, rivers, and the internet. Hmm. And water. The comment was like, can we create an herbal tonic? that will help shift people's minds and consciousnesses and disseminate it through the internet, which is this sort of meta <laughs> phenomenon that human beings have created in the last 50, 60 years. Working on it. <laughs> uh, what if they could all just have dandelion root tincture for start? Yeah, you know? let's start with that. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, but they don't even need to start with it out of their own yards. Right. If they start trying it, then it shifts their mind, then they make those changes, then we have our herbal victory gardens. And no glyphosate. Exactly. Exactly.
I'll just add one quick thing to that last one, which is the, I was at the Organic Grower School in North Carolina last year, and uh, after hours there was kind of a bar situation, and um, people had made these kefir drinks. was wasn't a dairy kefir; it was a, a you know just more of a, a, a beverage soda type beverage that was had a lot of you know a good microbiology in it. But they also had about 20 tinctures on the table, and you'd basically get your drink, and they had information about each herb and which one you might be needing at that moment and put a few drops of this and a few drops of that. And it was like a whole different concept of, of, for me about uh, what kind of you know, after hours drinks and where that could go mentally. Um, it was fascinating. I think it's exactly what you're talking about. Uh, let's see, who was next? Uh, Faith in the back was, okay. You, you, you. you talked about uh, detoxing and you mentioned this that we look for that once a year, the twice a year shot that's gonna detox us. One principle in permaculture is slow and simple. And subversiveness as opposed to action-oriented uh, changes. Mm -hmm. Because when you're subversive, it's all of us touching our, our circle. And I find that it seems to be much more effective whether it's, it's you know, in your own body or it's in the land or it's in socialism or politicalism that if I can influence one group of people that is surrounding me, that's where the changes seem to be made more faster because it's slower. Hmm. So I don't know if you could comment on that. You're talking about grassroots versus top-down? Right. Well, we're not even grassroots just because grassroots tends to be an organization mm. as opposed to your personal influence. For example, uh, somebody, your families are growing chickens and there's a person that has a lawn that they put all the chemicals on. Well, they see what's happening in this place with the chickens, that would be an example. Um, then they change to a organic lawn care. And then this person puts in a garden. And then they actually get a pig and put it on somebody else's land, but they have a pig. That kind of thing. That's a personal experience, mm -hmm. just one of the many. But I want to know if you have that same thought as far as the, the approach to detoxifying across the board. I, can you respond I, think, to I think urban gardeners are doing that. I mean, creating a whole new culture and relationship for kids who probably have never seen where a carrot grows. And I, I always said that. Urban gardens, you know, people keep saying that they were going to feed the seed and stuff. I said, don't bother with that argumentation. That's a very colonized way of thinking about it. Think of the urban gardens as a detoxification from our misunderstanding and disconnection from where, how food actually comes to be. Now, if we could do some of this reconnectedness you're talking about with, the, say, the urban gardens of America, we could probably reach quite a few million people relatively fast. Maybe not grassroots, but dandelion roots um, <laughs> would probably. I'm starting to actually think about this. What about mass social manipulation like that? I mean, it's not like the, the, the corporate totalitarian system that we live under isn't doing that anyway. By the way, just keep in mind, we don't have capitalism. Uh, we have corporate totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. And between the two, I would rather government totalitarianism, which we rejected and fought, uh, to corporate totalitarianism, mm -hmm. um, just to put that in mind in, in the context of this conversation. This I, okay, let me speak to that real quickly, though. Um, so we had a conversation at lunch in the uh, BFA chapter meeting, and it was uh, it had to do with trying to reach a lot of people, and I, I, I'm. I'm feeling like you're kind of getting at the same thing. I, ha I relate a story of, um, you know, I, be, I travel around a lot and I inspect organic farms and I've watched uh, 30 years ago some of the tendencies of, it's like the first initial person trying to go organic um, in, in a lot of places and they take a lot of heat and they have to deal with uh, all kinds of issues about having buffer zones and cleaning equipment and so on and so forth. But I've watched it over 30 years and instead of trying to have somebody go in and influence everybody all at once, you get 
into these communities and one person seeds in a, a process and now I can take you to places where there's virtually no conventional agriculture there. Everybody has gone organic because even if they oppose it, they're, they're, they're exposed to it. We haven't been talking a lot, enough about feedback, but I think you know feedback loops are, are hugely powerful and a lot of change has occurred. Maybe it's a little slow and we you know there's a sense of urgency, but it does work where you let the people uh, let their neighbors influence them rather than somebody from outside coming in with, a, with some big ideas. Anyway, um, who was next? I think you were. Yeah, I come from part of Canada where like, the empirical um, reductionist worldview is still like really, really strong. I'm the only farmer using any kind of natural methods in like, probably 80 square miles. Um, <laughs> so I need to, I need to do the best I can to speak the language. Um, but what feels really potent to me lately is that after I finish the technical fixes in my garden, I sit down in the clover and I just pray. And I, I ask for the forgiveness of the soil. And I ask to be a part of the process of grace and, and the regeneration and rebuilding and supporting human health. And I want, to, I want people to join me on that, right? I'll, I envision this basically a prayer circle out in a massive canola field. Um, and people just saying, you know, help us and help us help you. And to me that feels like a, a, a big non-technical lever that we can all pull on. Um, but so I'm curious, I mean, if I just go to my community and say, hey, let's do this, I'll get food off the stage, right? <laughs> so are you aware of anything happening in the modern world similar to that with measurable outcomes? Yeah. Maybe I can speak to it briefly, in the, and, and it's not in the context of agriculture, but it's my experience watching the interface between what we might call regenerative medical practices that are embodied by traditional herbalism and the technocratic, corporate, we might call industrialized mill machine that is modern healthcare. And there's really a, some amazing, life-saving, very important advances that have been brought by modern healthcare. It's important. We need to maintain that system, but we also know that it's somewhat broken. If the herbalist is able to approach the physician who works in this modern model with the language that they've been trained in, that they're willing to listen because the common goal that we have is the well-being of the patients, if that makes sense. So if we can find common ground, um, and I don't, I don't know because I, I'm just an amateur herb gardener, exactly what that would look like in agriculture at a larger scale, but if we can find common ground or common goals, and we can, it, it probably is something we would have to do rather than conventional farmers, but if we can find the language to meet them on their own terms and be able to discuss some of these systems in a way that makes sense, then I think we'll start to see some of the same things that are happening in medicine, which is greater tolerance to some of the alternative ways of thinking. And in fact, what I'm seeing now is that physicians are seeking that out. So I normally think that medicine is like way behind the curve and is always the last to adopt some of the like principles in physics and chemistry that we recognize are indicative of broad intelligence in nature. But really, it seems based on what you're saying, at least where you live, that agriculture is further behind than medicine. So I think we can apply some of the same ideas, maybe, um, if we can find that common ground, but I think we will have to explain it in modern scientific terms to be able to do that effectively. And I don't think that's impossible. I'm just you know, watching Reginaldo's your presentation yesterday, it's perfect to be able to approach what the left brain mind is looking for, right? And then we're viruses. Once we get that foot in the door, some of the things that John Kempf was saying today, which is it actually is the most appropriate technology. It actually maximizes profits. So if we can get our foot in the door, then maybe people will start to see this. And that's what we're seeing in medicine, that some of these strategies that herbal medicine and nutrition brings actually now insurance companies are starting to pay for because it reduces their long-term costs because it is the most appropriate and effective technology. So I don't know if that helps or touches on what you were saying at all, but I think Faith has been waiting the longest back in the back. I don't want to ignore her. It's not really a question. It's just a, uh, a comment and awareness that through the conferences that I've been attending here and mostly here, 
Um, and especially this one, but last year also, um, with uh, uh, Gerald Pollack and you know the fourth phase of water and um, Zach Bush's awareness of just like you know John was mentioning in his talk and does you know mention this often that you know microorganisms they can in many cases transition from being pathogenic to symbiotic you know they're pathogenic hmm. and so just like with viruses are they truly um, are they symbiotic? Are they really serving a purpose? Or are they here to this Right. And so, so with the comment about the, the walnut trees and the walnut grove and how nothing would grow under the, the walnut grove and that, um, it was because um, that walnut's trees or that walnut tree's um, uh, needs were not being met. And so it then was sending out chemistry into the soil um, Rhizosphere that was only calling to it the microorganisms that would support that that need for for insecurity, fear, greed, you know, whatever it is. Just I, I can't support others. I need to only support myself. And so I'm sending this chemical message out into the soil. That's what we do as humans when our needs aren't met. When we can't, um, when we're not feeling abundant and, and connected. Um, my assumption, my theory is, is that we then send out these chemical messages. You know, every time I'm breathing, right now, my loud voice, my breath, I'm sending out microRNA that you're breathing in. And so I'm affecting you even though, um, and it's not just through your ears, you know, it's something that you'll take away with you. And every breath that you're breathing, you're affecting me. And I'm taking a little bit of that with me. And so that builds diversity in my genetics. And it also builds the ability for me to, to support more diverse microorganisms. Um, but just that, that fractal awareness that, um, that that walnut grove, once those chickens came in under that canopy and started bringing that diversity of microorganisms and, and information into the, into the base of that grove, under the drip line, and, and the right organisms were then um, present and could be called for. Abundance was... Um, possible. It was met. And so then it's like, oh, I can share now. I can, I can allow you to come in. I can build a more diverse friend network. You know, that, that fractal nature of the universe is so fascinating and trying to see those um, connections. And then with uh, Poussin, uh, Olivier's talk yesterday, he showed this video of uh, the root, the, the rhizosphere, and the exclusion zone of water that's right around all of the root hairs and the roots. And so, and through the, it was actually of the mycorrhizal network that was connected to a plant. And then how the um, uh, pseudomonas species of bacteria were traveling in this, this little zone of water right next to the, uh, the hyphae of the, of the fungi. There's this really narrow uh, exclusion zone of water, the easy water was right there. And the pseudomonas were traveling in real time. You've ever seen the video. It's like zoom, zoom, up and down the the um, hyphae. And they're it's like they're going to work. They're going to go do. They, you know they're on their highways. You know they're going to work. But you see it. You look at it in that video, and it's like that looks exactly like my vascular system. You know the it's exactly like my vascular system. And so you know the fractal nature of all of this. It's that interconnectedness, and then. We, we go to sleep and we forget that we're all connected, but we can use these physical um, awarenesses that we're now able to see how how um, how how it's all illustrated right here for us. And you know, with John just bringing up this new awareness with James White's papers about uh, endophagy, and that the microorganisms we don't eat, we don't we don't pull our nutrients. Um, out of the food that we consume. We're not consuming food. We're consuming the metabolites of the microorganisms who consume our food for us, same for the plants. And those microorganisms going through the root hairs, they, um, you know, the root tips, they go through the root tips. Some of them are completely dissolved, but some of them just have their outer membrane consumed, just like um, uh, Bill, uh, Bruce Lipton says, you know, the, the brain is the membrane. The membrane of the mic of the cell, all the information is held in the cell. That's stripped off inside the inside the root, and then the um, cytoplasm, the the non-membrane cell, leaves through the root hair. A new root hair is stimulated, and it leaves through the root hair, and then the plant feeds that microorganism that had its sustenance removed, that had its membrane removed, feeds it the sustenance it needs to rebuild. Because 
come strong again, go back around, feed the next round. And so it's so symbiotic. <laughs> Can I just okay. make a quick comment? I know there's a couple people waiting, but I wanted to relate back to the walnut story one more time and just encourage us to think about it this way, <laughs> which is, is go what viral. if that garden or environment where the walnut tree grew was actually in charge? And it's controlling Reginaldo's mind <laughs> and getting him to pay attention to the tree. <laughs> And it's also controlling the tree's mind. I'd like you to, to just think about that for a second and see where it takes you. And, and then a lot of the chemistry that these multiple organisms, including ourselves, make will start to make a little more sense. Mm -hmm. But the key takeaway for me is it only works because Reginaldo's out there actually interfacing with the chemistry mm -hmm. and being part of that system. It wouldn't work if you were researching this business in a box in front of a computer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, let's see. I think... One over here, and then Chris, I see you've been waiting in the back, and then we'll go from there. Let's try to be relatively quick, because we're in our last <coughs> few minutes. Um, so um, this is kind of jumping subjects, because I was jumping off of you, and then got other things in between. But, um, and I've been holding this for a while, when, and jumping back to the very beginning, of uh, you folks talking about sitting and taking that time to have the feedback loop with, with our other beings that were part of and, um, and also, I, I just wanted to add the element of also when we're in rhythmic motion, like when I'm making a blueberry field all day, every day, for 10 days straight, and especially with a group of people, and we're all in rhythmic motion, our bodies are made for that. I'm also a mental health provider. There's, you know, brain gym, there's EMDR, um, there's REM sleep where our eyes go back and forth to download, you know, right brain to left brain and sort, sort down ex experiential. Um, Data. stuff and, <laughs> and um, that's also meditation it doesn't have to be sitting still yeah. this, this rhythm motion is part of it and it's also um, when, when you find rhythmic motion with other people um, those other farmers may have manual tasks if you participate together and you get that, that physical rhythmic connection that's often a, a real jump start for finding common or just having common ground um, okay. Chris, and then we'll go from there. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, back to the walnut again. <laughs> uh, well, I've done a lot of research with uh, plant gene match and also uh, compounds of plant release. Um, they also release pheromones and compounds that attract uh, predatory insects. Mm -hmm. to, if, if they're being attacked, they, they release. Uh, Compounds to attract predatory birds to kill the pets. Uh, lettuce, for instance, uh, if it is cut instead of torn, uh, it does not react the same way. If, if it's cut, uh, it sometimes will die and instead of uh, growing back. As you know, you can reharvest lettuce. Well, that's because it does not mimic animals eating. Um, Interesting. Also, uh, a lot of people don't realize, you know, with connectivity, uh, the moon and bio uh, not just tide and things of that nature, but uh, just with uh, growing and uh, a lot of uh, indigenous uh, concepts of moon and planting. And, um, so it's, it's just interesting about uh, you know, the connectivity with that and the walnut trees. Mm. Technically, we're out of time here. I'm, I'm okay with hanging a little bit, but um, I think uh, we opened up a, a window here, <clears throat> and um, maybe if people want to continue on this track in general to communicate back that back to the conference folks and uh, uh, maybe we can make this an ongoing track because obviously there's, uh, it doesn't end, you know, we just kind of began to draw something out of the shadows. What would you call it, Mark? Uh, well, they were talking about a consciousness track, but I think it's, um, I don't know, I, I, it is, you know, it's the psychological compatibility with, with diversity. Maybe we can have an online <laughs> competition on, or <laughs> brainstorm, but to the, to the, 
situation in Canada that, that our friend oh, yeah. described, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to definitely point out that conventional farmers are very set on a lot of the things they do, uh, not necessarily because they derived much benefit out of it, but most of the time is because they are afraid of leaving that space. And not, not, most of the time is actually just economics. They are in debt, and but that debt creates the fear, and it just feeds is a, is a mm. is a vicious cycle. And if we can do the walnut experiment with them, now that we have a reference point, um, <laughs> if you relax their life, like for example, I was having a conversation yesterday with this group of investors, you know, and. Um, and I said, they asked me, so how do you make money with your systems and all of that? And I said, um, why do I need to make money? Uh, right? I said, well, would you, don't you want to create wealth and all of that? I am wealthy. And I am creating wealth. I don't have to keep it. I just have to create it. And so... I said, now, here's the thing. I still need a basic income. I still got kids. I still got to put them through college and all of that. That's not of my doing. But if, say, in this group, we agreed that we're going to take care of each other's situation, mm -hmm. basic. I'm not talking about, you know, grandiose things or ambitious situations, but the basics so that we can actually relieve ourselves mm -hmm. of all of that pressure that makes us afraid mm -hmm. and unable to change then we don't need any of this other stuff. And so if we, when we do that to these farmers we're talking about, when we actually collectively create that relaxation space, they do have a walnut somewhere in there. <laughs> and they will see the world that way. And we are experiencing that to the other point about how you create change. It actually does work. And, and that some of them uh, in Nebraska, one of those farmers actually broke crying and the reason was because he said he was already like 60, 65 when, when we came in full circle and it took a couple of years. And what he said was that he can't believe that he had wasted his whole, whole life chasing a beach ball that was so big that every time he got close and tried to grab it, all he did was push it farther. So let's keep it, let's keep that in our heads as we think of this time.